you know the exhibit, have you ever done a thing about the exhibitor revolt? Uh, my dad, who you knew. Yeah. A real grandfather of the industry. Uh, yeah. And he'd, he'd be amazed actually at what the industry looks like now. But um, it, it was quite, uh, he, he, he told me the story that he ran these series events when Montgomery, do you remember Montgomery did the Garden Festival? Yeah. And they did the Garden Festival yeah. at Stoke. Yeah. It was one of those things that was supposed to leave a nice place behind it. That's right. Yeah. So um, the, the idea was that they could run a series of consumer events and use the audience that was coming through to the Garden Festival. Uh, only no one came. So he had, the, he had this whole like summer of consumer events with this uh, kind of temporary structure. And it was like just week after week after week and it, it, of no one coming, no one coming, no one coming. Awful. Um, and uh, one morning he comes in, and like no one's on their stand, no one. So he, said, oh. so he walks to the back of the hall, and he said, "Jesus." Oh, okay. <laughs> so he walks into the office, and there, every exhibitor is lined up like this. And what, we want to talk to you. Yeah, and Dad says, uh, "Okay, uh, well, who's the ringleader then?" And this one guy sort of steps forward. He says, "Well, I'm not really a ringleader, but..." And he hands him this bit of paper, you know, with all their signatures on. And he said, uh, "We're just, we're just all really unhappy that there's no visitors." So Dad went, "Oh, great! Where do I sign?" <laughs> well, it, yeah, I mean, it's a dangerous business to be in, but I mean, it's also incredibly satisfying when you get it right, of course. Do you want a drink? Should we have a drink? Well, good question. I don't really drink anymore. Do you not? not? Really, I'll have a glass of water or something. But yeah. Get, should we, I'll get, come and get a soft drink with you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I was saying to Matey that although we're not in the music industry, we spend two and a half million quid a year on bands for events, mm. which, I mean, is so far away from selling exhibition stands. You know, having we're in that. We book a lot of bands, mainly for our car fest and pub in the park. Come on, who, who's the biggest diva? I'll tell you a really good thing is one of the things about cool music acts, the cooler they are, the faster they leave when they come off stage. Okay. So, you know, if you bounce off stage and you're straight in a car and you're gone, mm. you're ahead of your audience. Now, the funniest one of those I've seen is Jules Holland does a lot of kind of car fests and things like that. Mm. And he has something like 20 people in his band. You know, he has that kind of ensemble vibe that he has on his TV show. I'm going to say, yeah, but... And <laughs> <laughs> no, he's a very, very cool... And he's a real musician's musician, and they're all there playing, and it's kind of extended jazz, really. Mm. And their last... I've seen them do this thing where their last act is this long... You know when the drummer has a go and the, bat, and, and the guy has a go and then leaves the stage? And I've seen them leave the stage and get in the car and go before the track's finished. That's quite good backstage sight. But we saw this once, so, you know, saxophone, okay, ladies and gentlemen, and he's, and he's gone in the car, and the Range Rover's gone. But the funny thing is, I saw it once where, and with Chris Evans on stage, you never know what's gonna happen. Mm. They'd started doing this, and 10 of them had left, and Chris Evans walks out without anyone talking to him in his ear and just says, should we have an encore, Jules? And they've gone. <laughs> <laughs> so although that's, not, that's the opposite of a diva thing, that's just cool, yeah. but kind of, the music business is very professional and grown up these days. Backstage, they're is it? When festivals are where they make their money now. It's not the mm. druggy, drunken vibe it might have been in the 70s and 80s. It's now the serious bit of their business. Well, it's, it's flipped on its head, hasn't yeah. it? I mean, because obviously they used to do a gig but make all their money through record sales and now they can't make any money through record sales. It seems now they make their name through music, download, yeah. and they make their money live. And that leads back to an important point, which is, although I suspect there are fewer human beings going to consumer exhibitions than maybe 10 years ago, there are way more buying tickets for things to go to, for days out, for events. But it's the category of event that has changed. Mm. You know, there weren't a lot of choices in the 70s. So you went to the motor show, and half a million people went to the motor show in, the, in Birmingham in the 70s. Mm because there was literally nothing else to do. There was that or watch Cracker Jack, mm. or watch a film about Evil Knievel. That was all there was in the 70s, and so you went to the motor show for a day out. And now there are you know 25 carver events in the, in the UK mm. that are worth going to, and there's all sorts of experiences, and there's, 
escape rooms and there's a massive festival industry and and so that's very exciting because there's more money being spent on tickets than any of us ever imagined and that's helped by the internet and it's helped by digital but you have to be ballsier and more creative to create content that is new. Well, I remember you actually talking, it might have been an UFI event or, or something similar, and you were telling us, okay, the world is changing, expectations going up, people want more, they want better experiences. That, for me, I mean, that, that, that was definitely foresight because that is what's happened completely. And so I guess what I'm asking you now is, how do you see the next 10 years? I think the need to go to a show to buy a car has gone. The need to, you can do that in a, in a car showroom or you do it online or, but if, what are people paying for? They're paying for things that make them fulfilled or mm -hmm. they're paying for things. So it's not just enough now to go to a music festival and get drunk and come back and say, that was a good time, but I can't remember it. Now you want to be spiritually uplifted how you want ideas. And, I, and we're starting to play with other events around concepts more than objects, um, rather than most of the things we've done over the years are subject related. Mm -hmm. I want food, I want, but if your learning is I want knowledge, or I want ideas, or I want kindness, mm. I actually think we're starting to do things that are about those kind of things. It sounds very, a little bit like I've lost it, so do you think that's an opportunity then for yes, organizers? Yes, I think, and I think for organizers in trade or consumer sectors, the event experience is important. Most of the transactions that can take place can take place without meeting, but the experiences that you create for people together, and I think our employees are changing, aren't they? They no longer just want a job. Mm. They now want to think they're doing something worthwhile, and I think events can help with that process. What would so, your funeral be? When they say, we can get the red arrows, mm. but it's 25 grand, mm. I wanted to say, F it, of course. Not, no, that would be showy offy. I want to be. <laughs> so uh, the conclusion really is, someone needs to pay for the red arrows at my funeral. Where do you get your inspiration from? Lots of our ideas are other people's ideas, but that's where I think our key point of difference is that we do them. We get out there and most people don't do that. Most people say, I thought of that. Yeah, you probably did. We did it.